Hey! <laughs> Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Happy Wednesday, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, I know we were, uh, we were talking about having Jojo Roper uh, on tonight. Um, he called earlier, and we both had a conflict, so uh, next Tuesday, I, I'm pretty sure we'll be on, um, maybe at the factory with Jojo and some of his boards. Um, so I got, I got a few questions to start with. Uh, which Tavarua boatman has the most barrel time on your boards? The question is, Terry or, or Gade? I think one of you guys probably sent it in, so I'd say you have an equal amount of tube time, which is ridiculous, since you've both been boatmen down there for over 20 years. Um, buoyancy discussion. What's the difference between EPS, epoxy, and PU? Volume calculators are fine, but I'm talking buoyancy. I run 1.5 to 2 liters on short boards and 2 to 4 on long boards. So if a customer rides a PU and wants an epoxy, I drop the volume by one and a half to two liters and vice versa if somebody's going from epoxy back to PU. Your thoughts? Well, um, yeah, you're, 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 sounds like you're a shaper, um, but, uh, uh, you know, epoxy, a lot of people don't even know what EPS, epoxy is, PU, polyester. Um, but the traditional foam we, we use is polyurethane, and it comes in various densities and weights, but the average blank uh, is, what would you say, Pedro, about four pounds on a short board? Um, anyways, the the glassing is what's different. Uh and the core is what's different. So if you have a polyurethane board and you glass it with polyester resin, that's probably the heaviest construction. Probably, it, well, I think it is the least, it's not even green. Uh, and it's old. It's just uh, the boards hold up for a while, but they don't have a very long life. The flex pattern doesn't last that long. So for years we've been uh, doing e-polys, which is a poly, a traditional polyurethane core, but it's glassed with epoxy resin. And the epoxy resin, uh, I mean, when we first started making uh, epoxy boards in the, in the mid eighties, uh, the resins were, uh, they weren't really considered, you know, the cosmetics weren't really considered for epoxy resins and the boards would come out kind of yellow and they'd yellow even faster. Um, but after Clark phone closed in 2005, Christmas? Yeah, December 05. Um, we, were, we, were, uh, we were struggling to find blanks. And the very first thing I did is I called an old friend that um, used to surf for GNS uh, when I worked there. Uh, Greg Lore and we've been in touch occasionally over the years and uh, not only had he embraced epoxy uh, EPS but he was manufacturing it and uh, we talked and so I said I you know I sampled foam from all over the world uh, some of it was pretty good most of it wasn't <laughs> uh, uh, but I started trying to source EPS and I, I mean in the in mid 80s I made some EPS boards for team riders but I made my first EPS board around 2005 and I freaked uh, because my I'm bigger I ride bigger boards and the you know this EPS board is at least 10% lighter than any uh, PU polyester board I had uh, so to try to get to the point um, I I think the finished product on an EPS board is about 10% lighter uh, than um, a polyurethane core and polyester resin. The e-polys lie somewhere in between because uh, polyurethane core, which is a heavier blank, the epoxy is...
that's that's my baby baby dog. But anyways, the uh, e, the e-poly is a nice in between. Uh, the EPS epoxy tends to be written more in small surf. It's more sensitive. Uh, it's some people call it twitchy, but in small surf, it's very flexible. It's got a very quick reaction time. Um, and people, you know, at first found it to be too buoyant, I guess. So we had to, you know, we realized that there was a bottom a bottom line on weight of the surfboards. And so we started uh, glassing them with a, a layer to a six ounce, and they still came out uh, much lighter than polyester, uh, polyurethane blanks, uh, glass jobs. So I think it's about 10%. So the average short board is, um, say 30 liters for, for argument's sake as 10% of that is 0.3 liters so it's uh, it's right on that on that verge of being able to feel it but I think it's more about the ride and when you get into bigger boards so they're say 60 liters uh, it could 10% uh, of 60 is 6 is that right? yeah uh, 6 liters so and you're right 10% of 30 liters is 3 liters. So you're, you're, you're kind of on track with the volume. And um, I'd recommend EPS for, you know, small everyday surf. Uh, I personally wrote it in all size surf. Uh, the E-Poly is um, a few points lower in weight. And uh, I think it rides insane. Uh... <laughs> What are your thoughts on small moon tails on barrel boards? Uh, I, everything works, it just works differently. The, the moon tails are a swallow tail, basically, but with even more area taken out of, uh, more area and volume taken out of the tail block. And it, it helps maintain a straighter rail line, uh, which if you're just gonna tuck in and run, uh, it's arguably a, a good tail. I um, most of my guns these days, uh, not most of them, but quite a few of them are sw are small swallowtails, like three and a half to four inches. And I've got I've got some old uh, collectible guns. I got a Defender for gun. It's a twelve footer, and it's got a little three inch square tail. So I think there's something to be said for having a little bit of width on the tail block and. Uh, you know, it helps helps you draw a longer line. It doesn't sink as much on turns. So, you know, the moon tails, sure, you know, they're they're uh, good for barrel riding. But then, a well designed swallow tail is, and a pin tail if it's not too narrow. Uh, I, I kind of stay away from real penny pins, and uh, I go with a narrow, almost a narrow. Uh, elliptical tail. Um, the Prana was an old favorite. What's the new version of this? The Prana, um, yeah, the Prana was it was a bestseller. I, uh, I, um, I think it. Oh gosh, it goes back into the middle mid to late nineties, and I saw. Chris Ward surfing backdoor one day on a Timmy Patterson, I believe. Uh, and it was a triple wing, kind of a fishy board, kind of a semi-round nose, but it was a fishy board. And it had three sets of wings, which really brought the area down. And it had kind of a thinner rail and uh, it was ripping on it. I, I'm sorry, Matt, it might've been you, Tim, it might've been you, but it was uh, one of you two great shapers from San Clemente. And uh, so I started building some, and uh, you know I've always been a fan of a break in the rail line. Uh, hot dog boards, maybe hard wings, uh, longer boards, a subtle bump, and then eventually when I get into like semi guns and stuff, I, I take I take the um, the bump out. But it's there on most of the boards I build. But 
having the, the triple set of wings really gave the board a lot of release and it, it helped pull the tail in so the tail you know behind your back foot there, there wasn't much area it stepped down and um so yeah that was a favorite for uh, 20 plus 20 years prana pedro oh yeah prana was solid In mid 90s maybe mid 90s all the way to maybe even before that but um uh, I, five or six years ago, there was a lot of um, a lot of marketing done by someone on a model called the Hypto Crypto, and I I looked at it and I said, "This board is so basic. It, it looks a lot like the Prana with an elliptical tail." And so I made, um, I mean, we had boards like that in the past, but. You know, the, the marketing on the Hippo Crypto was so intense. Uh, a lot of people uh, bought off on them and wrote them, and a lot of people liked them. But the uh, the smoothie, uh, the Prana was a smoothie roots. And uh, I built one for a friend six, maybe six or seven years ago. And he really liked it. And so I built a few more for people. And uh, it didn't take long before it was one of our best sellers. And, uh, I think, you know, as was the Hippo Crypto, it's a good all-around board. Uh, it's not a, uh, I wouldn't call it, a, you know, like a, a contest performance board, but it, you can ride it small enough to where you can uh, really throw it around, you can put it up in the air, you can um, do clean turns on it because of the tail template that helps with the cleaner turns. And uh, it's got, a, one of the key things about it is got a lower, a little bit lower entry rocker, which with a, a additional width helps you catch waves much easier. And then once you're up and riding the tail, uh, the tail dimension is uh, pretty similar to a typical shortboard um, in the high 14s, the low 15s. And, uh, but it's got, Performant, it's got kind of performance shortboard rocker. It's pretty close, but the entry rocker is a half inch less, three quarters of an inch less. And it continues to be um, a very popular board. And it's a board I recommend to people uh, if they're looking, you know, for an everyday fun board, if they're kind of new and they want to come down off of a longer board, uh, which is something I'll touch on in a minute here. Um, uh, so it, you know, and it can be written, I've built five foot to four ten smoothies. I've built nine foot smoothies, but the average smoothie is like six, six to seven foot long. And, um, uh, pretty much everyone that's gotten has really been psyched. So, um, uh, are there any conventionally accepted surf design rules that you believe are untrue well with the internet and social media becoming so available that uh, a lot of new shapers and i was a new shaper once but a lot of new shapers have uh design takes that you know i don't necessarily agree with, um, but I, you know, there's a lot <laughs> I disagree with. Um, I mean, one of, like with twin fins these days, twin fins are super popular. A twin fin to me means two fins. It is not a two plus one. And there's so many people out there selling three boxes that are calling it a twin fin because they have a little stabilizer back in the back of the board. And in my experience, I've tried that. I tried it years and years and years ago. Um, the small fin gives you a, a, a little bit of a sense of direction with the two fins, because if you've never ridden a two fin board before, uh, you, you kind of feel miss, something missing in the tail. But if you stick with it, you'll you'll understand um, if the if the twin if it's two fins and it's well designed, uh, you can ride them in pretty big hull of surf. Um, and the small fin, I actually feel like it, you know, it gives you a false sense of security, 
but at the same time it creates drag you know it's like uh, on a four fin you know you have four and a half inch front fins and I've experimented a lot with four fins uh, when you start getting under four inches, you start pushing those rear fins through the water. They're not really redirecting the water as much as you are pushing them through the water. And it doesn't sound like much, but a quarter of an inch makes a big difference. And I think the same thing happens with <laughs> the, the twin fins plus one boards. I, if you're going to get a twin fin... I would get a twin from uh, twin from from you know a, a, a shaper with a good reputation, and it has two fin boxes or two glass ones. But the third box, I don't know why they call it a twin fin. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, you got any more questions? This is guy asking about the pin holes that we do on a, on the torsion spring. Um. Really? The, don't be no. Bad. Uh, chill. I'm going to very. No. Chill. So <laughs> It'll lock you up. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the designs that we do, or, or types of construction we do, is the torsion spring. And that is um, an extruded styrofoam. The, the extruded styrofoam has been around for a long time. And. Uh, for a long time, all, all that was available was blue. Um, Dow or whoever makes it um, color-coded that. It was, it was used in the construction industry and it's basically waterproof. Um, uh, but we've managed to source it over the years and we've got nice white uh, extruded styrofoam. And it, it has to be glass with epoxy. Um, the Extruded styrofoam uh, gases a little bit. Is that right, Pedro? Yeah, I mean, when it, exposed to the sun. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it is very, it is sensitive to the sun. Yeah, yeah. And when the foam heats up, it off gases a little bit, and that would create some uh, delamination issues. Not big, but you know, small bubbles here and there on the boards. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's our most durable construction. Um, it's waterproof, but we have to put, we found that we've had to put pinholes in the deck. Um, and the reason for that is to allow the gas to come out and the pinholes really don't, they're not big enough to really let m much water in or no, water no, no, no yeah. yeah, they're small. It's, they're very small and, but it lets the gas out and it keeps the water from uh, getting into the board. And um, so a lot of people think, well, my board's defective. I just got my new board. And it's got pinholes in it, but that's uh, part of your construction. And it's, uh, you know, we've had very, very, very good results with it. And it's also the greenest construction, I believe. Yeah, it's, all recyclable. Uh, yeah, everything's recyclable. This guy uh, wants you to talk about Talk Blackbird. Oh, the Blackbird, huh? Uh, talk Blackbird. Yeah. Um. Well, the Blackbird, I'll give you a little bit of uh, lineage on it. It, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago when Kelly had those, had those little step-down boards, maybe 15 years ago, the pipe, he was like riding a 5.7 or 5.8 a pipe. Yeah, long water pipe. And uh, uh, my, my uh, co-partner here, Pedro, who's been with me for over 30 years, great shaper, good, a good surfer, he said, let's try one. So I made him one. Were you in Hawaii when you tried that no, board? No, it was here. It was here. But he said, wow, man, that board works insane. So I started, you know, I built some for Josh Kerr and uh, some of the other team guys, and they liked it. Um, the Slayer had the wide point pr pulled a couple of inches forward. It had a slightly fuller nose, uh, a little bit more relaxed entry rocker, and it had a longer, like if it was a five Six. It had the rail line of a five ten or a six zero in the back, the back part of the board, and uh, people really liked them in slabby type ways, where you you know you take off late and you you pull in and grin. Um, but when you know they tried to bring them up the face, it, the the longer rail line kind of inhibited a little bit the maneuverability of the Slayer. 
And so I, I designed this layer too. I pulled the wide point back to the middle and narrowed the nose a little bit and uh, gave it a little bit more nose rocker and a little bit more tail rocker. And uh, so the Slayer 2 is more of a proper step up. Uh, the Blackbird, uh, I, we had the Terminator for a long, long time and that was like a go-to step up. Um, it was the, it was the, um, oh, the Traveler, the, tra the Traveler, the Terminator was a big guy board. Yeah. The, tra uh, the, the, the Traveler was our go-to step up board for a long time. And it kind of, it kind of looked at, uh, typical proportions of the time where the nose is about two inches narrower than the tail and, and the wide points an inch or two behind center. And it had a fair bit of, a lot of nose rocker and a fair bit of tail rocker. And, um, I, I just decided it was time to update that board into more modern sensibilities. Um, uh, modern sensibilities. And uh, so, um, you know, I served blacks most of my life since the mid, mid 60s. And, you know, I, I realized early, early on, it's, you know, you need a, a board for everyday surf, but you need a, um, a step up. And so, um, compared to the Traveler, the, the Blackbird and the Slayer too, the Blackbird um, has a little bit fuller uh, template than the Traveler and a little bit less rocker. Uh, but it's more streamlined than the Slayer too. It's got a slightly narrower nose and uh, more tail rocker, and the wide point is back uh, around the middle, maybe a touch behind center. And uh, the Blackboard, the Blackbird's been a go-to now for six, you know, five or six years, and uh, that's a board I I can grow up and down the, up and down the line too. And I've made. Um, <clears throat> Blackbirds, you know, eight six. I made them down into the low fives, but the the Blackbird is meant to be a step up. The Slayer two is meant to be a step up, maybe a couple of inches longer than your shortboard. The Blackbird, more like four to five to six inches longer. So if you're riding a a six zero, you might you can get a Blackbird a couple of inches longer. But uh, my thoughts are is uh, you you know shortboards these days are so well designed you can take them into a little bit bigger surf than you used to be able to. And so the Blackbird is a step up for when there's a real, a real swell. Um, six foot means something very different to everybody. Uh, but, you know, double overhead surf, double, triple overhead surf. And um, Blackbird kind of represents what my sh whole shaping philosophy is about. It's about balance. Um, I always, I never really, I made Shane Haran some uh, boards in the early 80s that had, very, you know, 16 inch tails and 11 inch, 11 and a half inch noses and they look very cartoonish. And he, um, he, he was, he was almost there. He's almost, almost winning, but, you know, came second quite a few years and, uh, and, he finally came to me. He'd get boards from me when he was here for the um, OP Pro and on, on tours. Um, but he kind of he came to me and said, Rusty, would you make me a regular tri-fin? I said, sure. And he, he ripped on it. But back to my point, I've, I've kind of felt like um, balance is, like if you ask me what one of the most important uh, design credos I have is balance. Um, the outline needs to be somewhat balanced. I, I think if it's you know too far behind center, then you have limitations. If it's too far forward, you have limitations. If the foil is you know tail heavy, or if the foil is nose heavy, the board starts to become have a narrow narrower band of performance. And so the Blackbird is um, is is a balanced step up it, it's you know I think the template's really appealing to the eye um, the foil is really appealing to the eye and the rocker and I think I think it's proven itself because uh, people come back time and time again for uh, you know a second blackbird a third blackbird a bigger blackbird 
And um, that, you know, that with the smoothie and the dwarf, those, those boards are, um, you know, some of our most popular designs, especially, in, you know, in the winter time, uh, people start really thinking about step up boards. So, it's a good one. Any thoughts of bringing back the C5s? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, I did a post on my personal Instagram yesterday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, I I like the C5. I really like the Twinser. And in the um, early 90s, uh, I was fascinated by the Twinsers and, and the boards that Will Jobson was making for Martin Potter. And the influence he had on Glenn Minami and the boards that Glenn Minami made for Martin Potter. And I tried a couple and... Um, you know, I really, I really like them. I mean, if the fin, if you get the fin placement right on a Twinser, it, it, it doesn't make sense, but it almost feels like less drag. You can, you can ride a slightly bigger fin, but it feels like less drive if the fins placed properly. And, you know, I, my thoughts on that were, uh, the base of the Twinser fin would be at the half point, would be at the front of the main fin, and it would be split the distance between the main fin and the rail and it would they'd all point to like two inches off the nose and uh, we had a pretty good run on the Twinsers and then I think it was 94, 95 94 I think um, Nick Carroll was the editor of Surfing Magazine and he uh, you know it was like one of the first maybe it wasn't it was maybe it was like an early um, stab, uh, you know, stab. What's it called? Stabs uh, board test where the different shapers. Stab in the dark. Stab in the dark, and um, so Nick contacted a, a bunch of the handful of the shapers that were popular at the time, and and um, you know I've always liked Twinsers. I've always liked channels for certain conditions. And uh, so I just, I kind of went for it. I just went, okay, I'll have the two main fins a little bit bigger than normal, the two small twinsers and a small trailer with four deep channels. And, uh, you know, you, as you, if you look at my Instagram last night, you could see the proportions were a nose that was probably two and a half, maybe plus inches narrower than the tail. And the wide point was definitely behind center by a couple of inches. And um, in order to promote the C5, um, we had a contest and uh, we, we were able, uh, PT was fortunate enough to get us a, a permit for uh, trestles. So we had the uh, anything but three contest. <laughs> we had the C5 challenge, which was 95, I think, or 96. And then the year after that, we had the anything but three. Um, C5 challenge, I, I, you know, I, I made what m were my thoughts on the proper fin setup and everything, and I made it public to, you know, to everybody and anybody who was interested. And um, a couple of entrants in the contest had C5s that looked pretty good, but a lot of them just had. Um, Tri fins with very, very, very small front fins, like, and they are in the wrong place, and they're the wrong angles, and, um, but you know the contest, uh, the contest was good because it stirred up some interest, and in, uh, it was right around the time Tom Curran, I think, um, uh, rode that. Um, it was Bordy Road in the end of the five seven. Uh, that should the other one, yeah, the fish. Yeah, he yeah, had a little fish and. Surf. And and then he you know he competed in New Jersey I think on the old twin fin and so people are starting to rethink um, you know something other than a tri fin works and uh, there's a lot of designs other than tri fins that work great and um, so we, we built the C5 for a while um, you know it costs a little a little bit extra to build and I'm not sure if that was part of the reason it fizzled. Um, but, uh, we occasionally make a Twinser these days and, 
I was surprised at the reaction I got on my Instagram post last night that there's that many people that had C files that they loved, and so we should bring it back. Yeah, we should we should bring it back. You know, it's like yeah. you know, I, I I totally give Will Jobson 100. percent As far as I know, he he created the Twinser design, and it it urged me to buy like books on hydrodynamics and try and figure out why it worked and what the best fin arrangement was. And so Will, I, I give Will a lot of credit for that. And um, uh, a shaper that used to work for me, he actually used to sand for me at Canyon years ago. And then he started shaping and he shaped for me for quite a few years. Stu Kenson still builds a lot of uh, Twinsers. He's a big fan. But when he, uh, when we were working together, we actually had a shop in IB together. Um, for a couple of years and then Desert Storm happened and the town was very military and so all the business base left and went to the Middle East. But um, I built I built myself a Twinser as a six eight I think. And Stu's Stu's not as big as me, but he's a pretty good sized guy and he tried it. He didn't want to give it back. And Stu's never really let go of the Twinser uh, concept. Uh, and he still uh, he still stands behind it. I do. He still builds a lot of them, and um, I think he and uh, probably we got a lot of great new models coming out, um, and uh, it's hard to let them all out at once. You know, we let a few out, and then we you know, work on refining the other ones and let them out a few months later. So um, I, I think you might see a C5. Why did you start to shape? Why? Why? Why did you start to shape? When I was a small boy, I heard mm -hmm. a voice. <laughs> Why did I start to shape? I, it's, I, I started, I, you know, I, I grew up and I loved to build things and make things. And my father was a mathematician, but on Sundays we'd, go fly these insane kites that, that he, he would design and he'd let me help build. And, and then, you know, I, I built uh, a couple of um, those stock, those road, you know, no, no, no engine, but they're go, like go-karts or, you know, you race them downhill, I forget the name, but I built those. And, and then when we moved, I had surfed a couple of times when we, when we lived in Sierra Mesa but it didn't really grab me. And when we moved to La Jolla in 60, summer of 65, I think, uh, um, when I first got there, I, I, I was more in the body surfing, but, um, uh, the next summer, 66, I got into surfing and, um, I bought a, I was so intrigued by, you know, how would you build a surfboard or how do you build a surfboard or, you know, what does it take? And I, I, um, actually bef a little before I started surfing that summer in 66, I hadn't actually surfed yet, but I bought a, a beat, a beat down longboard for 10 bucks. And I loved, you know, I loved playing with resin and fiberglass cloth and practice fixing dings even before I stood on a surfboard. Um, and, and, uh, so I started, I started surfing summer of 66 properly. And uh, I've talked about my early boards plenty of times. Um, but uh, late 67, early 68 was, I mean, it was the Renaissance. It was, uh, there was footage of, uh, you know, some, some great surfers riding Bob McTavish's boards at Honolulu Bay and Nat Young. And, Bob and um, writing shorter boards with V-bottoms and it was interesting because we the surf magazines there was Surfer and there was Surfing I think or Surfing World uh, or International Surfing before Surfing Magazine and the ads half the magazine was full of longboard ads and half the magazine was full of shortboard you know shorter board ads and the boards a lot of the stores were full of longboards, and um, you know, I used to joke. I joke about this sometimes because back then, 
Um, gas was 25 cents a gallon and a board was 200 bucks. Now gas is 20 times that much, not quite maybe. Surfboards are five times. So the surfboards have been dragging their heels in, in real time in terms of cost. But um, it, so the, mag, the early the spring magazines created quite a contradiction and everybody always wanted something new and uh, the longboard sat and they got marked they were originally like in the low 200s and they got marked down and down and down and were basically considered worthless for a few years and uh, Mitch's had opened recently as a shop in La Jolla that sold <laughs> he walked in and it was a clusterfuck there was blanks everywhere there was no meaning, no rhyme to it, just blanks everywhere. And there was cans of resin behind the counter and a roll, a couple rolls of cloth. And, you know, I could, I could, uh, no matter how bad it was, I could build my early boards. It would cost me 30 bucks, 15 for a blank. I think I might have bought seconds. I think the first for 20, but 15 bucks for a blank and, uh, 10, you know, 10 bucks for the cloth. And, Five bucks for a gallon of resin. How much is a gallon of resin these days? Seventeen. Seventeen bucks? And a fin box. So yeah, for around 30, 35 bucks I can pull. Polyester. Uh, polyester, yeah. For, yeah, so I, you know, it was, you know, 200 versus 35 back then. That was a huge difference. And none of the longboards, they were, they were arcane. And um, so the whole world started, that. that's when the, I don't know if there was a garage revolution before that one, but there was the true garage revolution where everybody just started shaping whatever. It was shorter, V-bottoms were let go for a little while, and then uh, mini guns, and uh, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I the first board I shaped, it was, for me, it was a, it was a, it was a life-changing experience. I, I, uh, the board, no, I'd say it wasn't very good, but it rode pretty good. You know, in my mind, it rode pretty good because I made it. But <laughs> I think that's the feeling a lot of shapers get out there, even on their first boards. <laughs> it might not be the best board, but it, it works pretty good. Uh, and so a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Ramsey, had at the bottom of the hill, uh, right, I think there's a fire station where his house used to be. And uh, his dad was like an old ranch guy, and he um, had a little chicken coop, just big enough to build a shaping room and a glassing room out in his side yard. And, and so uh, Charles was making boards there, Blaine, Broderson, Xavier, probably a few other guys. And so that's, that was kind of my first, uh, my first factory. <laughs> I, I shaped a few boards in a few people's backyards, like uh, Nick Britton. I don't know if you're listening, but he just got a couple of boards for me uh, in, in late 69, early 70. Uh, I shaped one in Nick's backyard. And, but, um, you know, after Charlie's, it, I, you know, I kind of, I was kind of go, I was going to UCSD for a while, but in the summers I'd work for GNS. And the first year at UCSD, I made Starlight surfboards. And I really got addicted to shaping. Um, and then I took a few years off, 72, three and four, just to s travel and shape. And um, then I went back to the university and I graduated, uh, UCSD and I graduated in 77, 78. And I said, okay, I got a degree, now what am I gonna do? And so I, one thing led to another and I just ended up shaping full time. and. Um, I, but the, the, the long and the short of it is, is it just, it, it, you know, the process of making something and making something that was utilitarian, something that you could actually ride and enjoy, that was, that was, uh, that was the, um, that was the greatest thrill in my life. And, you know, I, I still love to shape and I shape every day. And, uh, you know, I've hand shaped 50,000 surfboards, but I've designed another 50,000 on the computer. And I know there's all, all these big arguments. What's oh, better, hand shaping? Or, I think hand shaping is fine if you're low volume. Um, but, you know, once your volume starts to get up, 
you're either going to get further behind on your orders or you're going to wear your joints out. <laughs> and I always sort of put roughly a thousand boards, 800 to a thousand boards a year as a turning point. And there are some great, great craftsmen out there that still just hand shape. But I think as you get in that, that 800 to 1,000 board range, you start needing help and you either get a ghost shaper or you uh, hire a, a cutting service or if you're fortunate enough, you eventually get your own machine. And I think there's, what, 250, 300 machines in the world right now? And the number's still growing. So, I, you know, the, the hand shaping will become not a lost art, but... It, um, it it will be a great starting point for all shapers. I know some pretty well famous shapers these days that I don't think they've ever hand shaped a board. Maybe a full, a, a few, but they've pretty much grown up in the computer age. And um, you know, there's I, I used to I used to trip on the amount of time it would take to hand shape a board. Uh, if you're really rushing, you can do it in less than an hour. If you're taking your time, it takes an hour and a half or two hours. And that's, that's a, I mean, that's a... Test fast. It's a, it's a test fast? Test, yeah. An hour and a half, to, hour, hour and a half is still kind of quick. But two hours, you know, it's... I'm thinking about like an hour and a half, two hour time frame. For the, human, for the human brain to stay focused and for your body to stay fresh. And it's a decent period of time for somebody to, if they're watching, they become absorbed in the process. And instead of it feeling like two hours, it feels like 10 minutes or 20 minutes and the board's done. And, um, you know, there, uh, there was always a great feeling, you know, that for years and years and years, you know, of doing a hand shape. And, I I became pretty proficient, and I mean, I I do shaping trips to other countries where I just lock myself in the room and I hand shape ten boards a day, a hundred boards in ten days, and do a and do a little and do a little bit of touristing, <laughs> a little bit, not much. <laughs> this guy asks you, what are your thoughts on asymmetricals? On asymmetricals, yeah, I I. I think there's a place, um, and I've addressed this many times before. My very first board in '67 was a Carl Extra Main Symmetrical. <laughs> I'm a goofy foot. It was made for a regular foot. It was made for a very small regular foot. So, and I was a beginner, so it didn't really it didn't matter. But um, as the years went by, I had a couple of team riders uh, back in the day. Uh, Henry Hester used to be um, uh, used to be a great. He still is a good surfer, but he was a great surfer back in the day and used to compete. And he he was like the first person that would regularly order asymmetricals, with, you know, with the longer rail and the inside rail and the shorter. It's like a lot like the exaggerated asymmetricals you see of today. Um, you know, I, I went to uh, Fiji the first time in 86 or seven. And that became like my go-to surf trip, and it's all laughs. Especially, I mean, restaurants is just such a perfect when it's on. It's such a perfect ruler edge laugh. And I, I had asymmetricals that I, I built, you know, specifically for restaurants. But um, you know, moving forward, uh, there's been more and more interest in asymmetricals, and some of the younger shapers are are. Um, doing very creative asymmetricals. Um, and I'll tell that story one more time. I, I had a, a Tom Survey. I met him in, in Fiji, I think, too. He was a photographer, and he, but he loved to surf. And he, he started having me make boards, and he got one board in particular that he loved. And he goes, Leslie, I need you to copy this board. And I think it was before uh, I had the computer uh, computer going, but I was very capable of copying a board very close. So I copied the board, you know, we've got glass. He tried it, he goes, yeah, it's a good board, but it's not the same. And I go, really? So we tried again, and he goes, this one's a little bit closer, but it's not the same. I went, bring that, bring that first magic board back in. And I measured it again, head to tail. And um, the one thing I discovered is uh, 
his sin placement was offset. His fin on one rail was back a half an inch, and the fin on the other rail was up half an inch, and that made a significant difference in how the board rode. And I think, you know, it's wonderful how imaginative and creative uh, some of these younger shapers are in their outlines. But I think there's a whole world of opportunity on um, your fin placement alone, much less just having one, you know, maybe your backside rail a little bit softer than your front side rail. And that's what Josh Kerr had me do one year for Chopu. And the next year he had me shape him a bunch of asymmetricals for Chopu. And he, he, Josh does, he always did pretty good. And um, so, yeah, I think there's a place. Um, uh, you know, but I think there's a call for a much more subtle approach, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's a good one. Can you share some of your, some of your thoughts on rail shapes for different boys? Hi, Doug. <laughs> she's, such, she's such an attention hog. Yeah. Get down. Come here. Get down. Come here. Um, rail shapes, uh, yeah, I'm kind of running out of time, but I'll address, I'll address rail shapes and, and then wrap it up. Um, I, I, I guess it goes way back in time to my roots when, um, I thought Henson's rails were too down, uh, too extreme. I thought Brewer's rails were pretty good. They, they had a lower apex and kind of an ang steep angular feel to them angular feel to them uh you know i i occasionally shape my board with a little bit rounder rail um uh, i think it depends on, on your deck contour too uh you know if you have a flatter deck that's going to want to move your the your deck uh, on the computer software it's called the deck point out further towards the apex and so I believe that you need to, uh, the flat of the deck gets the uh, more angular the rail needs to be. Um, the type of rails I don't like are, are round rails. <laughs> are round rails where the, um, you know, uh, got a higher apex and a lot of tuck. And to me, those rails are just, uh, they just seem insensitive. You know, you really gotta you gotta bury the whole rail. Whereas um, uh, a rail it doesn't necessarily have to have a flat deck, but a rail that's a little bit steeper, but the apex is lower, and it's um, slightly angular. I, those rails, especially once you get used to them, they tend to you tend to find that they set quicker and they release quicker, and. Um, but the rounder rails, yeah, you have to, they don't, you know, it, it takes more effort to set the rail. They go in deeper, they might come out a little bit slower. Um, you know, but then again, if you have a very low, low, low volume board with lots of rocker, um, you're, you're doing a different type of turn anyways. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the boards I see out in the marketplace, and when I'm talking the apex, the apex is, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, like you have the, the bottom of the blank, you have the top of the blank, you have the start of the deck line, and then you have your apex, which is, um, I average my apex is say roughly five eighths of an inch up from the bottom, maybe point. 6.5 or 0.7 but that's getting that's getting pretty high up and uh, of course the bigger the board the thicker the board is the more that apex is going to move up but um, I think anything under a half inch it'll get up on top of the water and it'll skate but it'll resist turns and uh, you probably have fun on it for a brief period but you'll I think eventually you'll want a rail with a more a conventional apex and a lot of the apexes that I see on a lot of the popular boards out there these days are 0 0.7 0 0.8 and that doesn't sound like much but in terms of the feel of the rail 
it, it really it really makes a big difference. So those are my thoughts. Um, it is 7.54, and I've been told that I have to keep this to an hour. Um, so I just want to wish all of you um, uh, health health stay healthy out there and we'll see you next tuesday i think next tuesday tuesday uh, i'll be more prepared and i'll be with jojo roper and a bunch of his guns to talk big waves and guns all right take care everybody hasta la vista